You may be seated. Colgate students, alumni, faculty, parents, trustees, past and emer present and emeritus, representatives of other distinguished institutions, Herbst family members, and other friends of the university, I welcome you to this celebration and inauguration of Jeffrey I. Herbst as Colgate University's 16th president. I want to acknowledge, too, the presence of an illustrious past president, Tom Bartlett, Colgate's 11th president. Jeff was named last November and said at the time, I am deeply honored to be appointed the 16th president of Colgate. The university exemplifies the very best in a liberal arts institution at a time when our society is searching for answers that only this type of learning experience can provide. I look forward to working with the Board of Trustees, faculty, students, staff, and alumni to promote this extraordinary community of scholars and to prepare students for the great challenges of the 21st century. Since that time, and especially following the July 1st beginning of his presidency, the initial promise of his appointment is being abundantly realized. We at Colgate, working closely with him, are already seeing the important directions of change he will be emphasizing. This will be an eventful era in Colgate's advance as a premier institution of higher learning. Joining me on the platform are persons who will represent important constituencies of the Colgate faculty or family in welcoming Jeff to Colgate. Now let us proceed to the celebration. Rabbi Stephen Nathan, Associate University Chaplain and Director of Jewish Life will offer the invocation on this important day. Rabbi. Ruach HaOlam, Spirit of the Universe, God of all humanity, God of all creation, we are here today to honor and to celebrate the start of a new era at Colgate. It is a time of joy and celebration, a moment of beginning filled with infinite potential for our new president and for all of us. Fewer than 30 days ago, we celebrated the beginning of a new Jewish year. Just yesterday, in synagogues around the world, Jews began anew the annual Torah reading cycle with the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, Bereshit. So how fitting that we are inaugurating President Herbst on this day. In the story of Adam and Eve, which we read in synagogues yesterday, God asks the question of Adam, Ayeka, where are you? We can also hear God ask each of us this question at every moment, if we listen carefully to the still, small voice within us all. But it is also each person's responsibility to continually address this question to each other and ourselves. And it is also the role of an institution of higher learning to constantly pose this question to its students, faculty, staff, administration, and extended community. In the Genesis narrative, God asks Adam this question when he was in hiding after eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So often we too hide from God, from our essence, when we hear this question. We are afraid because we, like our biblical ancestors, are all too aware of the good and evil around us. We know all too well what challenges face us as we try to make the right choices. We are also afraid that we may not know the answer to the question, Ayeka, where are you? Or if we do, that it will not be the answer that God wants or that we want, and so we hide. Where are you is not an easy question either to ask or to answer. When Adam heard the question, he may have heard it as God asking him to face his responsibility and his guilt, to come out of hiding and see where and who he is. We too can hear in the question God's voice imploring us to recognize our own responsibility for where we are right now and where our world is as well. 
we can hear it calling upon us to ponder our responsibility for the good and evil in our lives and our world. For, as the late Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, in a free society, some are guilty while all are responsible. God questioning us as to where we are should be viewed in terms of the responsibility we bear, but also from a place of clarity and equanimity. How do we honestly feel about what we've done to lead up to this moment? Have we achieved all that we had hoped? Have we achieved even more than we could ever imagine? But we are also being asked, where am I? Where are we going to plant our feet as we take the next step on the journey? This can engender more fear and, anticipation, and trepidation or a sense of anticipation, excitement, or more likely some combination of them all. And so we must take the next step carefully, but we must take it. In the Jewish tradition, we are reminded that even in the moments of greatest joy, such as now, there is also sadness. In the past weeks, our nation has witnessed the tragic suicides of three middle and high school teens and two college students, due at least in part to bullying, intolerance, and homophobia. These heartbreaking events make it all too clear to those of us in higher education, indeed to our whole society, that there is indeed evil as well as good in our world. They also call upon our society to take a hard look at its answer to the question, where are you? We must look at where we are, where our institutions are, and where our culture is. Then we must work together so that our communal and societal journey leads to a place of joy and healing, and not one of sorrow and tragedy. Indeed, as we have been called to do this weekend by President Herbst, we must find our sense of place, individually, and communally. We must search deep within to find the answer in this moment to God's question, and then prepare to take the next step of our journey together with one another. Shekhinah, holy divine presence, bless not only our new president, but bless all of us here in this chapel, on this campus, in this town, in our hometowns, and throughout our world with the ability to ask difficult questions. Mekor HaChayim, source of life, grant us the strength to search for the answers and help us find compassion for ourselves and others when the answers elude us. Che Olamim, life of all worlds, grant us the courage to continue the search for our sense of place and the answer to the question, Ayeka, where are you in this and every moment? And I close with the traditional blessing for all joyous occasions, which translated means, blessed are you, eternal our God, sovereign of the universe, who has kept us alive and sustained us and allowed us to reach this moment in time. Those who know the blessing, please join me. And the rest of us, I'll cue you when to say amen at the end. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehechianu, Bikiyamanu, Bihigianu, Lazman Hazeh. And let us say, Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Nathan. <clears throat> now I'm pleased to introduce J. Christopher Clifford, class of 67, parent of Carrie Clifford, class of 93, and chair of Colgate's Board of Trustees since 1999. We congratulate Chris and the entire board on the successful completion of the presidential search and call him forward to present the university key to Jeffrey Herbst. Good morning. It is my great pleasure and honor as chair of the Board of Trustees to thank all of you for journeying to the fair Shenango Valley for this auspicious moment in Colgate's history. Just over a hundred years ago, President-elect George Merrill and his wife arrived by train in Hamilton, I'm told on the 136 train. I'm not sure where the heck the station is today. <clears throat> 
They were helped into a coach that was affixed to sleigh runners to which a long garland rope had been attached. And as unlikely as this may sound, they were transported with joyous procession by the undergraduates of Colgate University. <clears throat> I understand that the inauguration committee immediately engaged on this idea and found it exceedingly compelling. Unfortunately, our unusual lack of snow <clears throat> has rendered this bright idea somewhat impractical today, much to the relief of some of our sleeping students, I'm sure. But in place of our ample student power, we are harnessing technology today and we are streaming over the internet worldwide uh, this ceremony. So I would like to welcome all of you who are hearing us over the internet uh, and thanking you for joining us, parents, alumni, and friends. In the chapel, I would also like to add my recognition to a number of key leaders at Colgate I am very grateful for Tom Bartlett to join us. <clears throat> Tom was the 11th president at, Pre at uh, Colgate. He served from 1969 through 1977, a very calm period in the history of the school. <clears throat> I would also like to welcome my predecessor, John Golden, class of 66. Uh, John served on the Board of Trustees from 1994 to 2007 and was chair from 2001 to 2007. And so the key activity of any board is finding the leader. Just over a year ago, <clears throat> we formed a committee comprised of members of the Board of Trustees, the faculty, the student body, and staff. And their most important mission was to select Colgate's 16th president. On behalf of my fellow board members, I express our sincere gratitude to the members of the search committee and to their chair, Peg Flanagan. Their diligence, creativity, helped identify a truly extraordinary candidate. Their enthusiasm, persistence, and powers of persuasion presented him with an invitation that it was impossible to refuse. I'm sure that's a call from President Obama, but he was supposed <laughs> He's five minutes late, and tell him we'll call him later, okay? <clears throat> he but I digress. Uh, Colgate. <laughs> Colgate is a university with strong traditions and worthy aspirations. Our faculty members are universally committed to teaching, to research, and to service. Our students possess a rare and admirable combination of academic ability and an intense level of engagement with the world around them. Our staff is dedicated, hardworking, and highly competent. And our alumni are loyal to each other and to this college in a way that is legendary. All of this energy comes together in a location 
that is arguably one of the most beautiful on earth. As Jeff Herbst has said many times, our location is one of our greatest assets. Indeed, we appreciate, we savor, and are transformed during the precious time we spend studying, living, and working here in the Shenango Valley. In the months I have known Jeff and observed him, I have seen him devour piles of information, which it took us a year to compile, uh, in what seemed like the blink of an eye. But say, saying so runs the risk of oversimplifying Jeff's approach. He hasn't jumped to conclusions. He has not been hasty to reach judgments. He has met with countless people, asked hundreds of questions, listened to the answers, sought clarification, and then sought insight. He's analytical, precise, level-headed, and fair. He is hardworking, creative, and blessed with boundless energy. In short, he is the perfect leader for Colgate. So I am here to report that I have delivered the charter and the key to the university to your office. When James B. Colgate presented the key at the inauguration of Colgate's sixth president, our same esteemed George Merrill in 1899, <clears throat> he described the symbolism of the key as follows. A key may be used to lock oneself in or to open the door to a wider life. Colgate has always opted for the open door. Welcome, President Jeffrey Herps. We are delighted to have you as our leader. Thank you, Chris. Next, I'm pleased to call forward Michael Newberg, Class of 2011, Vice President of Colgate Student, Govern Student Government Association. Mike is a member of the Theta Chi Fraternity and the Canocioni Honor Society, and he brings greetings to President Herbst on behalf of the 2,900 undergraduates of Colgate Student Body. Michael. Hello. It's truly an honor to be here speaking on behalf of the student body at the historic inauguration of Colgate's 16th president. I first met President Herbst uh, when he came to our student government executive board orientation in late August. He shared with us his goals for Colgate and his initial impressions of the school and the town of Hamilton that has become his new home. Immediately I was struck by his genuine interest in student perspectives and key issues, listening attentively to our concerns and suggestions and diligently taking notes. We spoke about a number of topics that will be essential in determining the direction of Colgate's future, expanding the study abroad program, the future of Greek life, and the importance of alcohol-free events on campus, among other things. President Herbst also informed us that he read the entire campus life survey, a lengthy document intended to take the pulse of the student body and over 700 student comments regarding the survey's results. This display of attentiveness to student perspectives is an admirable quality of a university president, and is, it is encouraging to see such a proactive approach to recognizing and addressing student concerns. I am confident that our new president's dedication and attention to student affairs will only continue to improve our school. Colgate is a unique and special institution with outstanding academics, rich traditions, world-class faculty, and highly motivated, diverse students. As Vice President of Colgate Student Government Association, I've become fully aware of the importance of this diversity. Students at Colgate are constantly presented with new worldviews from their peers and are challenged to think from different perspectives. With more diversity in the class of 2014 than ever before, 
Students have an even greater opportunity to learn from each other, both inside and outside the classroom. I know that internationalization, increased socioeconomic diversity, and exposure to different ways of life are notions that President Herbst championed at Miami University, and I look forward to seeing his passions integrated into Colgate's future. Perhaps the greatest strength that President Herbst can bring to our school is his distinctive perspective and worldview, gained from an impressive resume of international research, experience teaching at exceptional institutions, and strong administrative background. Just as the diversity of the student body stimulates important conversations and affords students the opportunity to learn from one another, a university president with strong foundations and a unique outlook will help shape Colgate in a positive way as we move forward into a more globalized and connected world. It is my hope that the students and administration will continue to uphold a strong working relationship, mutually benefiting from each other's opinions and perspectives. It is only through this sturdy collaboration between student groups and faculty that our university will keep moving in a favorable direction. Under the guidance and leadership of President Herbst, I have no doubt that Colgate will continue to improve, solidifying its place among the top educational institutions of America and continuing a tradition of excellence that spans over 190 years. On behalf of the entire student body, it is my honor and privilege to welcome President Herbst to Colgate. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Jill Harson joined the Colgate faculty in 1982. She's a professor of history and has served Colgate in a variety of very important mm -hmm. roles including last year, 2009-10, as Interim Provost and Dean of the Faculty. Jill was named Colgate's AAUP Professor of the Year for 2010, and now she is here to welcome Jeff to the faculty and present him with the gavel that is traditionally used to convene meetings of the faculty. Jill. Jeffrey Herbst, the 16th president of Colgate University. It is my great honor on behalf of the, the faculty to present to you in this maroon box the presidential gavel and to welcome you to the special place that is Colgate. Indeed, you have already been a part of this place for several months. In your convocation address this year to the entering class, you said a number of things that resonated with all of us. You urge students to take a few steps off their own beaten paths, to take intellectual risks, and you shared with them and with us your own experiences as a student traveling and, and studying in Africa. You urge them not to be passive learners, but to take the chances that Colgate affords them to work directly with faculty members, uh, to find answers to questions that perhaps have not yet been asked, uh, have never been asked before and you reminded them of the mutual respect and honor that must be a part of the community of scholars. All of these fundamental aspects of the mission and fiber of Colgate. In the Colgate faculty, you will find good partners, a group of people who care deeply about our roles as scholars and teachers. We are passionate about the research and creative work that we do, and we know that our creative and scholarly activity is a way of continuing to learn and to bring that latest knowledge to the classroom. We are truly committed to teaching and to thinking about what we do and how we might do it better. And we are a community working through vital decisions, policy changes, and curricular revisions in a way that takes advantage of our multiple perspectives and also binds us together. We are all at the beginning of a very exciting moment in the history of Colgate, exciting not only because of the challenges facing higher education in general, but also because of the places we will be going together in the future. So it is my great honor to present to you, Jeffrey Herbst, on behalf of the Colgate faculty, the presidential gavel, the symbol of the governance system of the faculty of Colgate University, and to welcome you with enthusiasm, warmth, and excitement.
Thank you, Jill. Next, here to welcome Jeff on behalf of Colgate's entire staff is Mari Assad, Associate Vice President for University Relations and Chair of the Inauguration Committee. Mari. Good morning, everyone. It was a great honor when Lau Rolas asked me to welcome President Jeff Herbst and his family on behalf of Colgate's more than 900 employees. When I interviewed for my job 13 years ago, I knew Colgate would be a special place for me because 13's always been my lucky number. <laughs> While 13 years at Colgate may sound like a long time, I'm a relative newcomer compared to the longest serving faculty member who has been here for over 47 years or the longest term service staff member who has been here for 43 years. On the flip side, I'm a veteran compared to our newest employee who has just begun here at Colgate on Monday. President Herbst, Colgate employees work very hard and they're very proud of the university and all of their students. No single word could describe everyone employed here. We come from diverse backgrounds and places and perform a broad range of tasks. Every time I approach Oak Drive, past Taylor Lake, Seven Oaks, where I really was supposed to be there today, but thank you, I'm up here and I'm enjoying it. I marvel at how beautiful our campus is. Our staff not only tends to Colgate's physical facilities, they tend to the well-being of all who work and live in this community. One important thing that binds us together is our love for the university, the knowledge that everyone is treated as an important contributor and is helping to provide an exceptional educational experience for our students. As Chris Clifford, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, observed at the inauguration lunch for our staff on Friday, President Herbst takes a keen interest in people. He asks questions and listens carefully to their answers. I hope that every member of our staff will have the opportunity to personally welcome President Herbst to our community not only this weekend, but throughout the coming years. Spend some time with him. Tell him your story. Share your ideas for the future of Colgate and for Hamilton. In closing, I'd like to add that the theme of this inaugural weekend, exploring our sense of place, is very relevant to our staff. This is our place. And with every day, with the change of our season, we continue our exploration. Jeff, Sharon, and family, we offer you a huge welcome from our staff. We look forward to your guidance and your wisdom. We know that you'll take great care of this institution and of all the people who call Colgate their home. This would also be a wonderful chance, since Mari chaired the inauguration committee, to thank all the people who worked very, very hard on this occasion, arranged things perfectly, including the weather, as you'll notice, uh, and, uh, and will have orchestrated a great lunch for us as well. So can I ask for a round of applause for this? <laughs> and thank you, Mari, especially. Uh, next, we will have a musical interlude performed by, by Claire, uh, Claire Pellerin, Annette Chantour, Laura James, and Chelsea Gottschalk.
Thanks so much. Dr. Greg Mills heads the Johannesburg-based Brenthurst Foundation, which is dedicated to strengthening Africa's economic performance. From 1996 to 2005, he served as the National Director of the South African Institute of International Affairs. He has lectured at universities and institutions in Africa and abroad, from the Pentagon to the Peruvian and Chilean Naval Staff Colleges. He is on the visiting staff of the NATO Higher Defense College in Rome and is a fellow of the London-based Royal Society of the Arts. Among Dr. Mill's books is Poverty to Prosperity, Globalization, Good Governance, and African Recovery, which he co-wrote with Jeffrey Herbst. His publication and journal credits include the International Herald Tribune, the New York Times, Time Magazine, the Sydney Morning Herald, and the Financial Times. As a fellow Africanist and grandson of a South African Grand Prix driver, D Dr. Mills is the perfect person to officially welcome Jeff Herbst to Colgate's driver's seat. <laughs> President Herbst, uh, Dr. Sharon Polanski, Mrs. Rose Herbst and me other members of the Herbst family, members of the Colgate Board of Trustees, I hope I have that correct, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, there's a wonderful saying in East Africa when you can't get all the names right that you just simply add all protocols I hope observed. <laughs> On our arrival this Friday at the Colgate Inn in Hamilton, we were given a maroon umbrella this was fitting of my role this memorable weekend, and not only because of the vagaries of the northern autumn, although I believe that most days apparently in Colgate, at least Sharon has been told, are like today. <laughs> <clears throat> in the Congo, a little under two years ago, Jeffrey and I found ourselves stuck at night in the driving rain between that country's border with Zambia, trying to negotiate our entry into the latter after the border's closing hours having spent the day with the governor of Katanga, a product himself of a liaison between a Jewish trader and a local Katangese woman who not only sported a Torah on his desk, but was dressed in a denim suit. Some things only in the Congo. <laughs> For those who have visited that border at a place called Kasumbaleza, it is a place where Dante's Inferno meets Mad Max on steroids. On the one side was the uncharted and lawlessness territory of the Congo, where governance is subjective at best. On the other, three kilometers of trucks, three abreast, which can be stuck there up to five weeks, clearing customs, followed by 150 kilometers of potholes and unlit roads, before at least we were to reach our guest house in Kitwe. We were quite literally marooned in the middle of nowhere. This is a story that ended well, however, though it involved negotiations with avarice immigration officials that Henry Kissinger would have been proud of, and the odd flat tire and bent rim on our car journey homewards. But the bit I remember the most is that while we were inside the Zambian customs facility pleading our case, or in fact I should say Jeffrey's case, because they were prepared to let me in but not him, because I was a South African and he not a rich American, someone stole, someone stole our umbrella, which lay on the counter quite literally, in front of our noses. You have to be quick-witted to survive in the Congo. Hence the connection between the umbrellas, the maroon umbrellas of Colgate, and the umbrellas of the Congo. I have known Professor Jeffrey Herbst for little over 23 years, since we first met in Chicago at the African Studies Association's annual conference. Then, as now, I was impressed by his scholarship and originality and clarity of thought illustrating what I've always believed to be the case. The sign of a great mind is to explain complex problems in a clear and succinct manner, just as the opposite, unfortunately, also holds true with some other colleagues. Over the ensuing nearly quarter of a century, we have worked closely together, conducted field work in some of the most difficult spots around the world, including Somalia and the Congo, and produced a number of collaborative articles and books. Jeff's great contribution to African studies is, I would boldly venture, threefold. The first is in his empirical studies on structural adjustment in Ghana and his PhD research on Zimbabwe, 
which remained seminal works two decades on. This reflects the fact that, unlike many researchers, he actually lived and worked in these places, that he was able to get under their skin and they, to an extent, under his, is evident in the depth of his analysis. Little wonder then that President John Kufour of Ghana sent this note to me upon learning of Jeffrey's new position. I quote, I am delighted to learn of Jeffrey Herbst's appointment as the 16th president of Colgate University. His book on Ghana remains a key text in our economic and political development. But he has been more than just a scholar of Africa. His work has successfully straddled the gap between academic and policy making. Sorry, academia and policy making. While grounded in field work, his writings have had strategic impact. We look forward, said the President, to many years of his continued engagement with our continent and wish him every success in his new role. And his role too in Zimbabwe is still well remembered. Its finance minister, a man called Tendai Beatty, is a man who has recently been responsible for stabilizing Zimbabwe's economy in the face of overwhelming problems and odds not least of which includes a rather recalcitrant government partner. He says of your new president, Professor Jeffrey Herbst is one of the great scholars of Africa in the United States. Having specialized in Africa during his studies at Yale and nearly two decades at Princeton. May I congratulate him on his appointment as president of Colgate University. We look forward to many more years of his contribution to academia and to Africa. May he continue to be a source of specialist research and a conduit to U.S. scholarship on Africa for Zimbabwe. Jeffrey's se second great contribution is that he is the first to, has been the first to advance this past decade what has subsequently become common cause amongst us Africanists, the notion of state differentiation. That Africa, in other words, is not just and should thus not be considered one thing but rather that there's a classification of states ranging from big to small, fragile to strong, mineral rich to landlocked. These different types pose different challenges to development specialists and demand more, far more nuanced sets of policies which most hitherto saw to be the case. With regard to Jeffrey's third contribution, it is most appropriate that the theme of this inauguration is focused on a sense of place. Over the years of our association, I have developed my understanding of African politics to the point that I believe the principal challenge to African prosperity is, the, is, is, is in the choices that leaders have and continue to make. This has led to a book I've just published on this topic called provocatively, Why Africa is Poor. But Jeff, as ever, is several steps ahead of me. The reasons why African leaders have made poor choices is the subject of his groundbreaking work on states and power in Africa. Those of you who have traveled in Africa will know, at least from your view out of the aircraft window, how few people there seem to be down there. To be somewhat more exact, about five times less than the density of Europe, for example. Population concentrations create certain disciplines of governance, including the raising of armies and taxes. Coupled with an African moratorium on the discussion about its colonial borders, African leadership has thus not been encouraged to adhere to these disciplines and to extend governance to the edge of these frontiers. This shared concern between us on state building has led us to write recently in foreign policy about the problems of governance in the Congo, that vast territory at the heart of Africa. Like Professor Herbst's earlier thought-provoking writings on Somalia, our assertion recently that there, quote, is no Congo excited a rather large number in the Congolese diaspora who mostly seem to be desperate to prove that there is. For a while we were famous, though probably in entirely the wrong circles and in the wrong way that our wives would have hoped for at least once upon a time. <laughs> this work has developed to the point that we have recently completed a study on fault lines in societies, why it is that some countries fracture around political, religious, ethnic and other divisions, and perhaps more importantly why some do not. This again was Jeff's idea, maintaining his status as a forward-thinking academic, one who is primarily interested in policy matters which have application to real-life situations. Indeed, a lot of the work that we have done together at the Brenthurst Foundation, where I work and where Jeff sits on the board, 
has indeed involved identifying and implementing best practice examples from around the world. General Sir David Richards, the Chief of the British Armed Forces, who is equivalent to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States, and the last non-American commander of ISAF in Afghanistan back in 2007, has written of Jeffrey, I quote, I first met Jeffrey Herbst at Swalu Kalahari Reserve in 2003 at a dialogue on peace support operations. I was immediately impressed by the depth and accessibility of his scholarship and the practical solutions that he offered. I look forward to continue to engage with him as president of Colgate University, a post which is richly deserved and one he will, I have every confidence, excel. He does assure me that he's not planning any invasions here, however. <laughs> Jeffrey is one then who's, not interest, who's interested in academia, not for academia's sake, but for the solutions that learning and knowledge offer to our everyday and to our future challenges. He is an internationalist steeped in local political and resource realities. As Ambassador Mark Bellamy, the director of the African St Center for Strategic Studies in Washington has said, Jeff's commanding scholarship has earned the respect not only of his academic peers, but also of policymakers and practitioners who value and regard Jeff's insights and judgment to a degree that is, in my experience, unmatched in this field. Even as he assumes new important responsibilities at Colgate, the ambassador writes, his many admirers in and around Washington are hoping that he will continue his path-breaking and authoritative work on African issues. This impact is potentially beyond just the US or Africa, in case you see me as too parochial for a moment. Dr. Juan Carlos Echeverri, the Minister of Finance of Colombia, also wrote to me upon hearing of Jeffrey's appointment. He says, I have worked extensively with Professor Jeffrey Herbst in helping to develop policy solutions in a number of African countries. I would like to add my personal congratulations to the, to the many he, he has received on his appointment as the President of Colgate. I look forward to continuing to work with him in the future when hopefully we will be able to convince him to visit us in Colombia. Ladies and gentlemen, for those who know me, it is testament to Jeff's character that in 23 years never a crossword has pa passed between us. This is remarkable not only given my personality, <laughs> but especially in academic environments where to cite C.P. Snow, the struggles are sometimes so bitter because the stakes are so low. Our personal friendship, to, friendship has blossomed into a friendship too between our families and Janet and I are honored that Je Jeffrey is the godfather to our youngest child. Indeed, Colgate is lucky to have not only such a great scholar as its new president, but also one of such character and integrity, someone who's always willing to give others the benefit of the doubt. As my opening anecdote from the Congo would indicate, we have shared many adventures together. We have walked the streets of Antananarivo in Madagascar on our mobile phones, trying to sell our houses on our respective continents between jobs. That may be a story for a different time, not least one about how the world is perhaps not yet perfectly flat. But the one anecdote that stands out the most in my mind was in Uganda, where we had gone to do some research on the state of that country's infrastructure, and where on our arrival at Kampala Airport, Jeff discovered that his new running shoes had been stolen from his bag at the airport. His comment at the time was that the thief had thoughtfully left his own shoes behind in Jeff's bag. <laughs> I did not have the heart to tell him that the man could not be seen walking through the airport spare shoes in hand. As I've said, this is a man who always sees the best side in people. His family has been the pillar behind Jeff in encouraging his career and allowing him, from my vantage, to go on such madcap trips. The way Matthew, Spencer, and Alana have grown up is also testament to Jeffrey and Sharon's parenting and their set of values. Colgate, you are extremely lucky to have Jeffrey Herbst as your 16th president. From what I've seen and the Colgate people I have met over the past few days, this will be a very happy and a productive partnership. You can be assured that even in a few days you have a new diplomat also for Colgate in Africa. And I wish Jeffrey and the, and the university very well in this association and look forward to being involved in a modest way from your African campus. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Greg. It's clear we should invite him back for more stories. <laughs> Two months ago, Jeffrey Herbst made his first speech here in the Colgate Chapel at the convocation ceremony for the class of 2014. He said, you are not entering grade 13, rather you are moving up the intellectual food chain from being a very intelligent consumer to a producer of knowledge and understanding. Jeff, too, is moving up to a university presidency, and today we celebrate that with him. I welcome him now to deliver his inauguration remarks, President Jeffrey Herbst. Thank you very much. Chris, Jill, Mike, and Mari, thank you for those kind words. And Greg, thank you also very much for not only traveling from Johannesburg, uh, but for giving those exceptionally kind remarks, which I was, were very moving to me. It is one of the great things about an academic career that you can work with someone for years, decades, exploring not only problems of great importance, but developing a profound friendship, something which I'm most grateful for. It is a pleasure and deep honor for me to officially begin my term as 16th president of Colgate. Sharon, our children, and I have been warmly embraced by the extended Colgate family, and we are very grateful for that welcome. In turn, I would like to extend my greetings and thanks to the many colleagues and friends who have come here today. Much of my own life and career is intertwined with memories of your friendship and working with you. Here I cannot but help but recognize S. Georgia Nugent, president of Kenyon College, who was my freshman academic advisor <laughs> 31 years ago at Princeton, when she was just beginning her own career as an assistant professor. Georgia as mentor, teacher and colleague has always been an inspiration. When I welcome you to Colgate, I introduce you to an institution that is many things, a school whose educational program ranks among the best in, a, in the country, a home for scholarship by an enormously talented faculty, the residence and focus of social life for 2,900 undergraduates, the object of memories and celebration for over 30,000 loyal alumni, and an ever-changing representation of how a liberal arts education remains relevant in the world today. Colgate is also a place with an unchanged location since its founding in 1819 here in Hamilton, nestled in the Chenango Valley. We have, in fact, always viewed this place as being absolutely central to our identity. As the alma mater goes, when through thy valley, fair Chenango twilight falls, bringing its silence to our college halls. Inevitably, when students are asked about their college, they answer proudly that I go to Colgate. The association of place and surroundings to the educational enterprise of colleges goes back as with so many great things in this country, to Thomas Jefferson. While designing the University of Virginia, Jefferson rejected previous models where colleges were housed in one building in favor of an exquisitely designed landscape of ground and structures that would yield what he called an academical village, which would be both cheaper, the pragmatist Jefferson thought, and able, as he said, to afford the quiet retirement so friendly to study. Today, the word campus, originally used by John Witherspoon to describe the grounds of Princeton, is synonymous with not only the physical setting of the university, but the school itself. Colgate's campus, inspired in part by Frederick Law Olmsted, is meant to be pleasing to the eye, but also a physical testament to the permanence of our mission here. 
The notion that there is something valuable and indeed quite magical about gathering faculty and students in one relatively small geographical place has been the central organizing principle of American higher education for hundreds of years. It is the nature of Colgate in particular and colleges more generally as a place that I want to explore today because for the first time in centuries the notion that one must go to college is being challenged. The web as it delivers content ever more quickly and as more entrepreneurs devise ways of transmitting educationally, education electronically has brought into the focus the question of whether the organizing principle of Colgate and all other colleges and universities is still relevant. Put simply, what is the role of place-based colleges in the digital age, whose defining characteristic has been to destroy long-held notions of space and human activity? More dramatically, will Web 2.0 and as in yet unforeseen technological developments along that arc, make going to college as old fashioned as going to the record store to buy music, the newsstand to get a newspaper, or the travel agent for a plane ticket. The question is critical because I believe that the web over the long term provides an existential threat to colleges as we understand them today. When we are faced in a few years with students who can participate in holographic classes in literature with other students around the world, and say an avatar named William Shakespeare, when the current generation of elementary and high school students who are already becoming accustomed to a la carte online education approach college in the same manner, and when parents ask if our cost structures really justify spending on what apparently can be garnered from an increasingly sophisticated internet for much less, we have to take notice. My thinking on this issue dates back to an exercise that my friend and then Vice President for Information Technology, Reed Christianberry, ran at Miami that asked what would happen if Google bought the University of Phoenix and made a run at four-year schools. I did not think the results were particularly attractive. I have also been deeply affected during the five wonderful years that we spent in Ohio when I drove through many towns that are today essentially deserted because the steel mill or the paper mill or the car factory or the car parts plant has gone away. The forces of creative destruction that have blown through the Midwest have destroyed communities, physical plants, and ways of life that other people thought were as durable as our universities. I do not believe that schools, especially Colgate, will disappear or seriously be challenged in the near future. However, notice has to be taken now of such a prolonged threat, profound threat to our organizing principle, and we must begin to react. Internet time is very quick, and industries that once secure can seemingly overnight confront a new competitor. Indeed, the loss of distinctness is pernicious and can happen quietly to a sector with little notice taken until one day it is gone. In a world where the corporate mission of Google is, quote, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, or where Facebook is becoming a platform to organize all the information Google may not care about, <laughs> or where a game developer can say, I want to build the game layer on top of the world, we have already lost something. Control over the taxonomy of information that was once the hallmark of universities. Indeed, while we still have serious debates internally about how information should be classified, the rest of the world apparently has moved on. This is not to say that our society might not be better off with Google, Facebook, and game developers organizing information. I always believe that more entrance into the competition is better. What I do know is that we have lost something and that the segue from the search function to the provision function may not be that great. What are the implications for Colgate? They are significant and I believe overwhelmingly positive. Put simply, 
we must preserve and enhance the one thing that the internet will not replace, the very human contact between professors and students, amongst the faculty, and between students that is the very essence of Colgate. Emails, tweets, videos, interactive online education will never be superior to the learning that occurs when a professor looks across a table from a student and sees if she is getting it or not. The synergy of students working shoulder to shoulder, even if it is around a laptop, or the serendipitous conversation between colleagues as they explore a new area of scholarship. We seek, as William Gibson might say, a deeper code. I believe that our approach to education, our community, but most importantly, our sense of place here in rural New York will allow us not only to navigate this challenging future, but also to significantly advance the university. When I ask generations of alumni from the 40s to recent graduates, what distinguishes Colgate they tie the powerful relationships that develop to our location here in Hamilton. What others perceive as the isolation of the campus leads to a deeply knit and very human community. Along with the village, we know that we are the only ones here and that our community is what we will make of it. Indeed, we will never apologize for our location because it is our particular place that defines us so distinctly as a community. The way to move forward is to take what others believe to be our most significant liability and turn it into our greatest strength. It is for this reason that Sharon and I decided to live in Watson House on the campus so that we could physically be part of the Colgate community. However, it is not enough to say that humans are social creatures that we will always crave physical meeting places and therefore the internet is no threat to us. It is a profound challenge and we must therefore be intentional in preserving, maintaining, and enhancing our community. At the same time, the internet age presents the wonderful opportunity to ask again what it means to be a community. My vision of a campus community that provides a human advantage over the internet begins with faculty and students interacting with each other while confronting as few obstacles to mixing as possible. That is how sense of place is maximized. What, after all, is the point of gathering us all here if we cannot interact freely? The village of Hamilton bonds every Saturday morning at the market because people mingle so freely around an acknowledged physical meeting place. No website, no matter how well designed, is going to replace that. In turn, we must continually punch holes in the silos that have been created on campus so that faculty and students work, play, and interact with whom they want, when they want. To the extent that disciplinary and administrative barriers prevent faculty, from teaching and working with whom they want, these structures must be examined. At all times, we must make sure that our structures are serving us, not that we are distorting our activity to serve them. In this regard, the Robert H. N. Ho Science Center stands out as an outstanding effort that allows scientists from many different disciplines to work together precisely because the space and the philosophy of the place has been designed to integrate rather than to separate. The extraordinary interdisciplinary efforts that are emerging in Ho vividly demonstrate the power of a campus without internal boundaries. And it is a pleasure to welcome back Bob Ho to campus today and to celebrate his great gift. Is, of course no more social activity than teaching. The university has struck the right balance I believe between scholarship and teaching. 
We recognize that to be excellent teachers, professors must not only understand the frontiers of their discipline, but also contribute to the advancement of knowledge. In 2010, posing a choice between research and teaching is a false vision, as our 280 outstanding scholar teachers demonstrate every day. We must therefore make sure that at all times we have the best means to evaluate teaching because it is a location-specific activity. Others can evaluate the scholarship of faculty and we ask them to do it. But we ourselves must evaluate how we are teaching. Indeed, it is important at all times that we adopt best practices in the evaluation of teaching and I am delighted that the Faculty Affairs Committee has decided to take on the task this year. I believe that it is imperative for our further distinction as a community of education that we at all times evaluate to the best extent possible how we are teaching each other. Likewise, I believe that the true social network is a student body that freely interacts and learns from each other in ways that are only possible by being here. Last year's campus life survey that portrayed students as more siloed than many would desire was disappointing because not all students are taking advantage of the unique community around them. We will work continually to remove barriers between students. Similarly, while we have achieved significant advances in numerical diversity, we must work further in making sure that faculty and students alike actually take advantage of the diverse community around them. It is for this reason that I discussed not only the number of underrepresented groups on campus with the dean of the college, but also how many students have roommates of different ethnic and racial backgrounds. It is also why I've made financial aid the highest priority in the 21 months remaining in our capital campaign passion for the climb. Garnering resources towards the ultimate goal of making Colgate need blind is an exceptionally important ambition that will make us an even richer community. I know that from my time at Miami, that the highest ambitions of Greek life organizations are to in develop intense human relationship through common bonds and service. At their best, fraternities and sororities enable extraordinarily rich and robust sets of social relationships that should be celebrated for the community they provide. And I will work with students and alumni to ensure that our fraternities and sororities have healthy chapters, but also serve as important anchors for a truly connected campus. And at the same time, we must provide equally rewarding and rich residential opportunities for those who choose not to enter Greek life organizations. We also have to develop a holistic vision of how we will use technology. This is not a question of whether the wireless network will work. <laughs> that today is like asking if we should have running water. Rather, we must develop an approach to technological developments that allows us to proactively adopt technologies that enhance, enhance human contact while taking note when our machines erode community. I was therefore delighted that my friend and former colleague Glenn Platt came to Colgate to give a talk on the inverted classroom, the notion he developed of pushing, pushing out as much of, as possible lecturing on a variety of platforms in order to maximize the precious time when faculty and students are in the classroom together. Managing technology will not be easy, but we can become distinctive if we use technology to maximize our human advantage in the internet age. I am therefore pleased that we will begin this discussion when University Librarian Joanne Schneider and Chief Information Officer David Gregory make an important presentation at the November faculty meeting on developing a new posture towards technology. That this was the first presentation I requested for our monthly faculty meeting should be a signal of the importance I attach to the issue. Another important aspect of community building 
is how we take care of ourselves and each other. Physical activity, whether through Division I sports, club sports, or recreation, has long been a defining feature of Colgate. We now have a significant opportunity to promote the wellness of ourselves and our community due to the generosity of our alumni and supporters. In January, the Trudy Fitness Center will open, providing students and faculty with a state-of-the-art facility to promote physical well-being. We will also soon be able to inaugurate the Shaw Wellness Institute, funded by trustees Jay and Debbie Shaw, that seeks to promote the general well-being of the student body through innovative programming and social norming a set of ideas that we can most help ourselves by informing each other how healthy the community is actually living. Finally, we have an innovative and exciting outdoor education program that allows many of our students to explore the wonders of New York State throughout the year. My meeting with the students who are participating in our outdoor education program was one of the most invigorating I have had, precisely because those students recognized the immense value of the place we were in and chose to celebrate it by hiking, skiing, climbing trees, and going into caves. They, <laughs> you don't have to do all of the above. They seem, to be the have, they seem to be having the most fun while drinking the least. Of course, celebrating our place and our community in the internet age is not an argument for turning against the outside world. My own work in Africa has always caused me to have an international orientation, and I've spent much of my own career promoting study abroad. Colgate study groups, an iconic aspect of our educational program, have long extended our community overseas. In the 21st century, we must seek additional models of study that provide students with opportunities to travel anywhere, especially in the regions outside of Europe that are becoming ever more important. This will require us to develop new programs in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, and new kinds of opportunities, while always working hard to make study abroad affordable to all. It is precisely because I value a sense of place that I believe that all students should live and study abroad for at least a semester. To, under those, to understand those societies and cultures as well. We do not lose anything when people study overseas. The point is not that they go, but that they can return, be welcomed, and contribute what they have learned. A critical part, of course, of our community is our 30,000 plus alumni who have lived here previously. I know from talking with alumni that they are seeking lifelong engagement with their alma mater to provide them with, the intellectual, with intellectual excitement and to sustain the flames of curiosity that first burned here. We will continue to engage our alumni through technology, but we will also encourage them to come back to Hamilton as often as possible. I saw this summer when I met the first participants in our extraordinarily successful Summer on the Hill program, the very first meeting that I had as president, how energizing it was for people to return to campus and to experience again the magic of this place. We will soon take measures that allow us to take even better advantage of the summer so we have a more complete understanding of how to use this beautiful place during a particularly wondrous period. Finally, the health of our community is intimately linked to the health of the village. As the mayor has heard me say many times now, one of the most striking facts about Colgate is that we will never move. <laughs> we have been here for 190 years and we will be here forever. The English department will not be outsourced to Singapore and the math department will not be relocated to South Carolina. This is a striking statement in a world that celebrates the mobility of electrons, capital, companies, and people. Since we will be here forever, we are joined at the hip with the village and the surrounding area, and we will continue to work hard to make sure that Hamilton and the region prosper and can be as healthy as they can be.
A community that works and plays together, that does not shy away from technology, but uses it to enhance our humanness, humanness, where people take care of one another and welcome back previous generations, that engages the world while caring deeply about what happens in the village green is a powerful thing. In an age threatened with technological enemy, it is what I believe people are looking for. Indeed, the breakdown in civility in our society, noted by many, including my sister Susan in her new book, is partially due, I believe, to our failure to develop and retain our sense of community in the internet age. We can achieve the sense of community because we live here in the Chenango Valley and because that is what we have always had. I look forward to being your president, colleague, and neighbor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those inspiring words, Jeff. Clarice Martin, Colgate's Jean Picker Chair and Professor of Philosophy and Religion, will now offer our reflection. After that, four Colgate students will lead us in the alma mater. They are Tyler Alexander, class of 11, representing the Colgate 13, Shelley Keegan, class of 11, of the Swinging Gates, Luis Maja, class of 11, of the Discords, and Kelly Unruh, class of 12, of the resolutions. Clarice. I have been asked to offer words of benediction. Let us pray. God of many names, infinite source of mercy, love, and righteousness, we give you thanks and praise for the promise and hope of this historic and grand occasion at Colgate University. Bless President Herbst and his leadership and ever inspire his vision for taking our great university forward in this century. God of new beginnings, inspire us all to believe in the infinite potential of new horizons. May we be renewed in intellectual passion and vigor, and may we welcome opportunities to meet the challenges of beckoning new frontiers in our communities, our nation, and our global human family. With courage kindled and spirits awakened to adventure, breathe new urgency into our love of life. O Holy One whose endless creativity delights to be expressed in the endeavor of human hearts and minds, bless the deliberations of our celebration this day and lead us forth with intentions of transformation, renewal, and justice. Amen. Twilight falls, bringing its song. 
silence to our college halls in that house.